Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's MinMD Real Talk webinar, Prostate Cancer Online Clinic. My name is Austin Hunt, and I'll be your moderator for this event. I work on the marketing team here at MinMD, and I'm excited to be hosting this session today. Also joining the call from MinMD today is Karen Bono. Karen will be joining us to help answer any questions relating to MinMD during the Q&A session. Before we get started, we have a short disclaimer that we need to review. The health and medical information provided during this webinar as well as the questions and responses from the webinar providers are solely for informational purposes. This content is not intended to take the place of advice or treatment from health professionals. Nothing presented in the webinar is intended to be used for medical evaluation, diagnosis, or treatment. It is not intended to substitute for your relationships with your own healthcare and pharmaceutical providers. Always seek the advice of your healthcare provider before beginning any new treatment or if you have questions regarding a medical condition. All right, with that being noted, I'm pleased to introduce today's presenters. First up, we have Dr. Kyle Schuyler. Dr. Schuyler is a fellowship-trained urologist who specializes in complex stone disease, urologic oncology, prostate cancer, and robotic surgery. Dr. Schuyler is located in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Next up, we have Dr. Herman Baga. Dr. Baga is a fellowship-trained urologist who specializes in sexual dysfunction, Crohn's disease, testosterone deficiency, prostate health, and other issues, including major genitourinary reconstruction, and is also located in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Today, they're going to be covering primary function of the prostate gland, the importance of annual screening, diagnosis, treatments and side effects, survivorship and maintaining quality of life after treatment, and then hold a live Q&A to close out the webinar. But without any further ado, let's kick things off by asking a few poll questions to the audience. So first question I'm going to be putting up on the screen right now. Have you been diagnosed with prostate cancer? Please select one, yes or no. All right, and we've got about 34% have said yes, 66 no. So for those of you who have, um, you know, this is going to be extra information on uh, stuff that you may be familiar with already. For those of you who haven't, you know, this might be some new information about what you haven't found out. So we'll go into the next question here. For those of you who have undergone treatment for prostate cancer, what have you tried? We'll give you a few seconds to answer these questions and we'll share the results again. All right, so it looks like the majority have uh, had radical prostatectomy, then radiation therapy and active surveillance is the final one. Thank you for that. And now we're gonna go on to the last question. Have you attended one of our previous MinMD Real Talk webinar events? All right, so it looks like 67% have attended one of our events previously. Thank you for coming back and being a repeat customer. And for those of you who haven't, welcome. All right, I wanted to thank everyone for joining us and thanks MenMD for hosting. Um, I'm gonna first kind of go over some uh, general prostate cancer um, topics and then uh, uh, hand it over to Dr. Baga to talk about uh, uh, kind of care after having prostate cancer treatment. So um, one of the things that, uh, or one of the importances about talking about prostate cancer is its prevalence. Um, uh, so in 2020, uh, there were 10 million new cancers diagnosed and prostate cancer was one of the most commonly diagnosed, making up about 14.1%. Um, as we can see here uh, on the right, part of this slide, uh, prevalence of prostate cancer increases with age. Uh, the old adage here is that if you live long enough, you're gonna get it. Um, that kind of uh, reiterates uh, what we'll talk about for the remainder of the, uh, remainder of my part of the prostate uh, cancer talk um, in that it's important, important to be uh, screening for this. Um, usually screening involves um, uh, PSAs um, and prostate, uh, exams, which you'll see later. You can go ahead. So as to what the prostate uh, is, it's a gland that kind of sits uh, below the bladder um, and encompasses the urethra like a donut. Um, it is part of the male reproductive organs and produces a majority of your seminal fluid. Um, as you can see in this picture to the right, Next. 
So prostate cancer, um, early detection is vital. Um, prostate cancer is often asymptomatic, which is why we do screening. Uh, we often do screening with PSAs and digital rectal exams. Uh, this typically starts at the age of 55 and goes to the age 70. There are some caveats to that. Um, and the reason that early detection is important uh, is, as I previously mentioned, it is asymptomatic. But if left untreated, prostate cancer can become symptomatic and much uh, less easy to treat. Uh, some of these symptoms that can occur after prostate cancer has uh, become more widely spread is urinary dysfunction, some blood in the urine, erectile dysfunction, also pain or weight loss. Um, the pain typically happens in bony prominences because uh, that's where prostate cancer tends to go to first. Next. So some of the uh, importances of uh, prostate cancer screening and diagnosis, as I mentioned, was uh, early screening and early detection. The digital rectal exam uh, often just performed once yearly in the office. An abnormal digital rectal exam often means that the prostate cancer um, or can uh, mean that the prostate cancer uh, has grown out of the capsule of the prostate uh, and that the disease is more advanced. There is a lot of variability um, between providers and, and uh, their ability to perform digital rectal exams, uh, which uh, sometimes leads to uh, unnecessary biopsies, to be honest with you. Um, it is often true that early cancers cannot be palpable, which is uh, Additionally, why we do PSA testing. One of the uh, pillars of PSA testing is, uh, as with anything else, it's not perfect. So one of the most important things is to repeat a PSA if elevated, and also to look for other reasons for PSA to be elevated, such as uh, infections. Um, there are some additional testing which ha has been used more recently, a PCA3, which is actually a, a urine test uh, that you perform after a digital rectal exam. Um, its sensitivity is about 70%. Uh, what you do is you actually do a prostate exam, a digital rectal exam, and then get the first voided urine. You can send that off uh, and it can uh, look for cancer within that voided urine. Now, as to how we uh, diagnose prostate cancer, we typically first uh, do the screening, which is the PSA and digital rectal exam. And then this leads uh, to a transrectal biopsy. This is usually done just in the office. Um, it most often consists of about 12 biopsies of the prostate. We then send this off to the pathologist to tell us whether there is or is not cancer. There are some adjuncts such as MRI guided fusion biopsies. Um, these biopsies tend to be more useful after someone's had a negative uh, uh, prostate biopsy initially and continues to have a rising PSA. Um, um, the reason the, the MRI is useful is it can actually allow us uh, to find prostate cancer in an area where we don't typically biopsy it. After we do it and the uh, pathologist looks at it, he'll tell us whether there is or is not cancer, and a positive biopsy will actually get a graded score. This is called the Gleason score. For those of you who have been diagnosed with cancer, I'm sure you've heard of the term the Gleason score. Um, it is a, uh, a scale that goes from 6 to 10. The higher the Gleason score, the more aggressive the cancer is thought to be. Um, how this allows us to uh, evaluate the cancers, it allows us to uh, risk stratify it. Um, as you can see here, we risk stratify it into um, low risk, intermediate risk, and high risk. There are some subsidiary uh, classifications of, of prostate cancer, but the uh, majority of them we label either low risk, intermediate risk, or high risk based on not only the prostate biopsy, but also your PSA. Um, now, as for treatment options, we tend to break treatment options into three general uh, treatment options, which, as most of you answered, would be uh, either active surveillance surgery or radiation. With active surveillance, um, the benefit is that you get to avoid unnecessary treatment or the side effects and risks of that treatment. Um, this allows you to delay treatment uh, until it is required. And in about two thirds of people, the, the appropriate people, um, treatment is never needed. One third end up going on to treatment because either there's a rise in their PSA um, or additional biopsies show worse cancer. Um, so the considerations with uh, active surveillance 
uh, is that it's typically for low risk prostate cancer and often involves getting a PSA every three to six months, a prostate exam every three to six months, repeat biopsies once a year. Um, and then occasionally we throw in there a MRI um, just to ensure that there's no worse cancer than we thought or concerns for worsening cancer. The, uh, one of the main treatment options for uh, prostate cancer is surgery in general. This is either done in an open approach or uh, more uh, often a robotic approach these days. This is only for confirmed prostate cancer and can be for any low risk, intermediate risk, or high risk cancer. What you do here is you actually remove the entirety of the prostate and the, with the goal of, of removing all of the cancer. This would prevent any spread of the disease if it has not spread uh, already. Um, uh, it is a highly effective treatment and often the PSA goes to zero or should go to zero after the prostate is removed. This then allows you to um, trend PSAs and look for recurrences by looking for a recurrence P uh, or a detectable PSA. Um, while this is an effective treatment with all surgery comes risks, there are the general risks of the abdominal surgery, which can be injury to anything in the belly. And um, more importantly for prostate uh, surgery, erectile dysfunction and incontinence. Erectile dysfunction um, can occur in anywhere from you know, 15 to 45% of people. Um, and uh, incontinence only occurs in about 5% of people long term. Uh, the nice thing about surgery is you can actually treat recurrences with radiation, um, uh, which is another primary treatment option as well. Um, radiation is a less invasive way of treating prostate cancer, and it is as uh, efficacious in treating the prostate cancer. Uh, this destroys the cancer cells either by radiation from outside your body that's directed at the prostate or by putting radioactive seeds in the biop or in the prostate um, via a little uh, outpatient procedure. Um, things to consider with radiation are, is it is often done in conjunction with uh, uh, what we call androgen deprivation therapy. That's actually giving you a medication that will drop your testosterone uh, and allows the radiation to work a little bit better. We've often uh, also been doing what we call a space or, which is placement of a gel between the rectum and the prostate. Um, this uh, allows to minimize any radiation to the rectum. Just like surgery, this also necessitates routine PSA levels, typically about every six months uh, for five years and uh, once yearly for an additional five years. Um, it uh, is as effective as surgery. Um, and the side effect profile is a little different in that it can also have erectile dysfunction and incontinence, but can have fatigue, uh, some worsening of your lower urinary tract symptoms, um, uh, and uh, some blood in the urine, blood in the stool. The one thing that's uh, to keep in mind after radiation is typically we don't treat recurrences with surgery. We often treat with other possible uh, treatment options such as cryotherapy or something of that sort. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Uh, Schuyler, for going over uh, how the cancer is diagnosed and treated. Uh, again, I'm Herman Baga. Thanks again for having me as well. You know, I'll tell you, I do guide a lot of patients through diagnosis and, you know, treatment and that sort of thing as well. But one of my real passions is cancer survivorship. So listen, you got you met someone like Dr. Schuyler. He took care of your cancer. He took it out robotically or got you through radiation. Uh, and you've had a cure, but how do you survive beyond that? Because like he mentioned, there are some risks, right? You go through it and it can continue to follow you through life. Now, certainly, we always highlight that the first thing is being cancer-free is the top priority. Thankfully, surgery and radiation have very high survival rates. You know, survival rate after prostate cancer, um, if it's caught early, five years survival rate is over 99% if you've undergone some sort of treatment. Um, so it's great to get treated um, and managed, but then how do you do these side effects? Side effects are really two, and Dr. Schuyler already started to talk about those. In general, you have some urinary issues and you have erectile issues. And those urinary issues, it depends which way you got treated. Now, a lot of you had surgery that you talked about on, you know, on the poll earlier. And when you have surgery, you have leakage of urine. It's almost like a leaky faucet, like a drip, 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 constant leakage. Maybe you move a little bit more, you try to exercise, 
it leaks even more and then you're going through things like pads that's the first thing that's listed over there um, if the pads aren't working then you try clamp clamp goes on the outside of the penis and literally squishes it so it's almost like a clothespin kind of effect where you're keeping that urine from leaking all the time sometimes you can think about right, medications medications are sometimes helpful it's actually not very helpful after surgery because again surgery is like a drip 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 like a leaky faucet and how's the medication going to cause that that valve to get you stronger medications are actually more helpful for after radiation so the way you have urinary dysfunction after radiation is you know that radiation we're trying to target it right at that prostate but some of it's going to hit some of the neighbors might hit some of the rectum might hit some of the bladder and when it hits the bladder, that bladder starts to get overactive, it starts to get irritated, starts to get annoyed, starts squeezing with not to squeeze. So in contrast, after radiation, you're going to have leakage of urine because that bladder is irritated and just squeezing what's not supposed to squeeze. Whereas with surgery, it's happening again. It's like a leaky faucet type of effect. That valve, that urinary sphincter is not working quite as well. So when you have an overactive bladder after radiation, that's when medications can be helpful for you. There's a lot of them. Some of you may have heard of these. There's Merbetric, Ditropan, Oxybutynin, um, you know, a whole slew of these medications that can be used. Um, we don't need to go into all those details, but they all basically do the same thing. They relax that bladder. Say, hey, relax. You don't have to squeeze so hard and keep you from leaking if your bladder is overly irritated. Other options include surgical options. So those last two, there's a urethral sling and the artificial urinary sphincter. Uh, these are very good after surgery, and again, we're concentrating a little bit more after surgery here just because that's what most of the people here um, have had, um, and uh, they are quite impressive kind of ways of keeping you from leaking. So urethral sling, it's like a little piece of mesh that we put in. It's a surgery I do very often. takes me less than an hour or so to do, and what's doing is it's actually pushing the urethra up closer to the valve or the sphincter. And what it's doing is it's counting on your natural sphincter's strength and just making it a more favorable place for it so it can squish on it a little bit better. It works for some men if you only have a little bit of leakage, but if you have a lot of leakage, then you gotta go for the gold standard, which is an artificial urinary sphincter. This is just an ingenious device. It's a little um, donut that goes around the urethra and literally compresses on it. I usually get a lot of questions about that, so I'll actually show a video because Pictures worth, pictures worth a thousand words, right? So you can see over here that big tube-like structure is your urethra, and around it, like a little donut, is that little that little uh, that that valve. And what it's doing is it's squeezing down right on there to keep you from leaking of any urine. See that it's squeezing down there and then it actually uncompresses. So what you have in this situation is you actually do a few pumps, it opens up for a period of two minutes, gives you two minutes to pee, and then automatically squeezes back down. So, you know, if a man has had prostate cancer treatment, whether it be from radiation or from surgery, and they're having leakage or they're an overactive bladder, they're getting up too, night, uh, too much at night or they're leaking all the time, whatever the problem may be, there usually is a solution. So I usually tell men that, hey, I know you're thankful that your cancer is treated, but that doesn't mean you have to live with this sort of leakage. One way or another, we can come up with a solution. Kind of roll through that quickly, but I'll leave the leave more specific uh, questions to, for the end because I also want to make sure we talk about erectile dysfunction after prostate cancer treatment. Now, like Dr. Schuyler mentioned, leakage of urine, things like that, about a five to seven percent long-term rate. Erectile dysfunction, unfortunately, is a lot more common after treatment, both for surgery and for radiation. Uh, the way that it works in radiation is, again, it's some of that, you know, innocent bystanders are getting hit by the radiation. That radiation is hitting the prostate, but the nerves that control your erections are actually sitting around that prostate. They're almost like wallpapered onto that prostate, and so they are going to get affected as well. With radiation, they'll slowly deteriorate over time because it's keeping them from regenerating themselves, and you can have worsening erectile dysfunction over the years. With surgery, you're literally, you know, cutting out that prostate. So these nerves, even if you're trying to spare the nerves, they're getting pulled, they're getting tugged so you can get the prostate out because you don't want to leave any cancer behind. Uh, and they incur some damage during that process. Uh, and they, you immediate, have an immediate hit of erectile dysfunction after surgery. 
Now, over time, you know, because the nerves are still there, oftentimes they do have a chance to heal. They may not be able to heal 100%, but in that initial period, they usually can, in the next one to three years, can achieve some sort of rebound in terms of their function. But what do you do in the meantime, whether it be surgery or radiation to help those nerves, to help you get a better erection? Or what do you do in the long term if, God forbid, you don't get erections back? Well, we have a lot of options for you. A lot of you have probably heard of um, oral medications. These include Viagra, Cialis, Levitra, Stendra, um, you know, plenty of medications, and they really all do the same thing. You know, the nerves are the on-off switch. They're telling it to turn on or turn off to tell the blood flow to come to the penis uh, for the erection. What these pills do is if there's something wrong with that on-off switch, it'll actually force the blood vessels to open up a little bit more easily so that you can have a better erection. Um, I often will start people on this right away, right after surgery, right after radiation, start to improve that blood, va blood vessels to open up so that more blood going in is more healing, more nourishment for the nerves. That's called penile rehabilitation. Uh, and so that they can actually heal up faster. And we've found that men can have return of erectile function up to six months quicker if we start uh, these medications soon on. But even during the short term or long term for a lot of men, this helps. As you know, you take this a little bit before sexual activity or in Cialis, you can take a daily dose as well. Intraurethral gel, um, that's a second type. That's, um, it's a gel-like compound that you actually inject right through the uh, tip of the penis with the openings called the urethral meatus. You put it right there, it actually gets absorbed from the inside directly into the penis. One of the advantages of a targeted therapy like this is, listen, if you take an oral medicine, take a tablet, it's getting diluted all over your body, right? Some of it makes it, you know, here, there, some of it hits your lungs, some of it hits your head, things like that, which is why you can have some of those side effects, like headaches, or some of you talk about dizziness, things like that. But if you put the medicine directly into the penis in the form of a gel, those side effects are reduced. Also, the amount of medicine going directly into the penis, because it's not diluted over the body, is a little bit greater. So you get a little bit of a targeted therapy with the gel. Um, or the next one, which is injections. Now, injections are a highly, highly effective mode of erectile dysfunction treatment. It sounds crazy. You're taking a little needle and you're injecting that medicine directly into the penis, but it is very effective. Think of it almost like a liquid Viagra. So what you're doing is you're pulling up a little bit of that medicine from a, from a vial into that syringe. That needle is like a hair-like needle, so you barely feel it goes directly into the penis, you inject it in, and you can have a really strong effect for most men. Again, you barely feel that needle. That needle's like a diabetic needle, same one that people use for insulin and things like that all the time, and they do that several times a day. The next option is a vacuum erection device. This can be used in along with the oral medicines if necessary, or during rehabilitation during that early period. Um, it's like a plastic or glass-like device that goes on the end of the penis, and it's a pump. It's, you're actually hitting the pump, it's pulling the blood in there, and you use a rubber band-like construction device at the base of the penis to hold all the blood there. It's got some advantages. It's a one-time cost. You have to keep paying for the medicine, uh, but it is a little inconvenient, so you really have to get your partner involved, things like that. That's where I really see anyone have success with the vacuum erection device. The last option is a penile uh, prosthetic, and that's a surgery that I do very frequently. Um, again, quite an ingenious surgery uh, where you put an implant in that'll actually help you get an erection. And I'll show you a video of that as well, because that is quite interesting. So in this one, you can see that there's these two little water balloons, basically, that are cylinders that go inside of the penile shaft. As this uh, person in the animation is squeezing the little pump, it's moving fluid into these little reservoirs. It's akin to filling up two little water balloons in the penis. And when the hit deflate, it goes right back down again. So it's all a closed system. It's that same fluid going in and out uh, from the reservoir uh, into the device. And it works very well, actually. But again, you know, it is a man-made device, so I tell people try everything else first. If nothing else works, it's an excellent way to get things taken care of for you. Um, but if you can get something else to work, like oral medicines or injections, you probably will get a better um, result in that it's a better erection. 
The last thing I'll touch on really quickly is testosterone replacement therapy after prostate cancer treatment. Now, this used to be very controversial. Um, you know, men have a testosterone loss as they age. You know, testosterone levels actually peak around age 35 and go down 1% per year thereafter. So men who've had prostate cancer and the average age of diagnosis for prostate cancer is 66. So you can see a lot of those men already have issues with low testosterone. And then those of them that get radiation may get medications that even reduce their testosterone further. So when they have a low testosterone, you probably all have heard this, you can feel a little fatigued, a little tired, lower libido, meaning not having that pepper, that energy that you used to have. Um, and you wanna have replacement to kind of get that energy back. It used to be very controversial because the concern was is it could cause your cancer to come back again. Why? Well, testosterone, for lack of a better way to put it, is kind of the food that prostate tissue likes to grow on. Uh, and so if you provide too much of that, it can nourish the prostate or any cancer cells and cause it to recur. Uh, but with good treatment, like a good surgery or good radiation, that rate is actually very low. So if you watch very closely, I do this for quite a few men. We've got gels, we've got injections, we've got clinical pellets, we've got natural supplements. And through all of these, we can usually bump up your testosterone level if required uh, to allow for that increase in energy or sexual function. And just because a man has had prostate cancer doesn't mean they can't this, get this kind of treatment anymore under most circumstances. So, you know, that's kind of a whirlwind. We wanted to keep it to 30 minutes where Dr. Uh, Schuyler and I were discussing treatment uh, and, um, uh, and survivorship. Uh, and uh, we can take the rest for questions. What do you think, Austin? Sounds good. If you stop sharing your screen, we will go full webcam um, for both of you, and then we'll go into the question and answer portion. All right, first question here. Uh, I'm just going to ask these questions. Uh, either one of you, feel free to jump in and answer, and feel, feel free to follow up on each other's answer as well. So first question here. This August will be four years since my prostatectomy. I've tried Viagra and injections, and neither have worked for me. Would the BED work for me, or am I a candidate for the implant? So, you know, unfortunately we do see this. I see this quite frequently just because I see the more advanced cases and I put your, you at one of those advanced cases. You've passed four years, so it is unlikely that the pills or the injections alone are going to work. Um, you really have two options here. The vacuum erection device you could try, but what I would recommend is try it with the tablets. So try a full dose Cialis or a full dose Viagra and use the vacuum erection device on top of that. You can combine those, um, but you cannot combine it with the injections. So if you want to combine it with the oral medicine, that would be your first try. Uh, if that still doesn't work, then you may want to start thinking about either really escalating those injections or thinking about the implant. All right. Next question here. I'm 60 and just starting to experience frequency and urgency. Should I be concerned? I'm going to take that, Herman. Yeah, go for it. Uh, frequency and urgency can um, be pretty common as you become older. Typically, I would not be concerned of cancer. Uh, while you should be undergoing prostate cancer screening with a PSA and a digital rectal exam every year, Symptoms are more likely just due to an enlarged prostate. Most enlarged prostates have nothing to do with cancer in itself um, uh, and are often uh, just an enlarged prostate. The prostate tends to get bigger as you get older, and a bigger uh, prostate it correlates more with symptoms associated with it. Often, uh, if the screening, the prostate cancer screening doesn't uh, show, show any concerns for uh, prostate cancer, then we usually just start with uh, medications as treatment. Absolutely, totally agree. You know, it's unlikely to be representing prostate cancer. It's more likely to be representing a large prostate. Also, things like diabetes, not drinking the right fluids, unhealthy diets. So work with your PCP to manage all that uh, and get your PSA screen, just like Dr. Scott recommends. All right, next question here. Uh, why is shrinkage so bad after radical prostatectomy? I had three inches of shrinkage. So, so you, okay, Dr. Scott. you so uh, um, part of the reason we get some shrinkage is because, uh, as you remember back to that that video, 
or that photo of where the prostate sits, it sits underneath the pro, uh, underneath the bladder. Um, so when you remove the prostate, uh, you lose that length of the urethra. You do have to hook the urethra back up to the prostate um, in order for things to uh, function uh, appropriately. And when you hook that urethra back up to the prostate, you do lose some length of penis. Usually I uh, tell people they're gonna lose about a centimeter in length. Um, as for three inches, um, that could also be to uh, secondary to other things if there's been any weight gain since the surgery for, uh, for any weight gain, you do lose some length or visible length more so than actual length. And there are other factors as well. As a man develops erectile dysfunction after surgery, you're not getting, that penis is not getting bathed as much with that blood flow. Remember we talked about that on-off switch, that on-off switch isn't quite, on, isn't as good. You're not getting as much blood flow to the penis. You're not getting as much nourishment. And then you have to develop scar tissue, fibrosis, things actually start to shrink down as a result. That actually happens to men, even if they haven't had prostate cancer treatment. I have a lot of men that come to my clinic with shrinkage from youth to older age. They have other issues like diabetes, et cetera, bad erections. So that's another reason to do things like penile rehabilitation therapy, medications, things like that, to keep bathing that blood flow. All right, got a kind of a general question here about enlarged prostate. So the regimen of Cialis assists with the shrinking of an enlarged prostate. So the Cialis is actually a good choice. It's mostly used for erectile dysfunction, but it also can help with urinary issues. What's interesting is it's not actually shrinking the prostate. So it's not that it's making it any smaller. Uh, what it's actually doing is it's relaxing the prostate a little bit so the urine can flow a little bit better, similar to other medications like Flomax, um, and has another benefit of helping with erectile dysfunction. All right, next question here. At age 64, I had a 24-pin prostate biopsy five years ago, and everything was negative. Now my PSA score is two points higher than five years ago. Is another biopsy in store for me? So possibly, it depends on where your PSA was. Um, a couple things to take into consideration is that the PSA should go up as you get older. Um, the prostate enlarges as you get older, so a bigger prostate typically means a higher PSA. Um, the um, For PSA screening, we, we kind of use a uh, age-adjusted PSA. So age 50 to 60, we tend to say about three and a half or less, 60 to 70, uh, four and a half or less, and, and 70 to 80, uh, six and a half or less. That assumes that your prostate is the size of someone uh, within that age range. Now, there's, it's not uncommon that I see someone where their uh, PSA is higher because their prostate's bigger than, than what we'd expect at that age. Um, so some of it would be determined by what your uh, uh, prostate size was at the time of your initial biopsy. But if everything pointed towards a, a second biopsy, usually I would get a prostate MRI before proceeding with a second biopsy. Then if the prostate biopsy is negative, then you feel a little bit better about just doing a, doing a normal prostate biopsy in the office uh, or watching the PSA even. Um, if the if the MRI is positive, then you can actually target the biopsy towards a specific spot in the prostate. All right, next question here. Uh, why, why is it that after three years after my prostatectomy, I still experience leakage during exercise? So, you know, the reason why, again, why you have problems with leakage initially is because that valve uh, is not working as well as it used to. Really, that's two reasons I kind of gl glossed over them. During surgery, you're pulling and you're tugging at the prostate, so that valve gets some physical damage. And number two, those nerves are affected. And again, there's an on-off switch to the valve as well that kind of gets uh, damaged during surgery. And so for those two reasons, uh, you can have leakage of urine, that valve isn't working, it's like a drip, 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 and it gets worse with activity jumping, sneezing, heavy aerobic activity puts pressure on the bladder, overwhelms that valve, and you start to leak like a leaky faucet. 
the initial period of healing after a radical prostatectomy is really six months to one year. And during that time, you're doing what's called Kegels exercises. You're tightening those muscles, trying to rehabilitate that sphincter with or without a physical therapist. After that one year mark, and frankly, realistically, even after six months, that window really starts to close because that's the period of time that your body can do some usual healing. So unfortunately, once you've hit that three year mark, it's unlikely that it's going to improve any further. And if that is an issue at this point, you may want to think about some surgical options like the slings or the valves, uh, or sphincters, which work very well. All right, moving on to the next question here. This one is about acoustic wave therapy. Uh, do you have any information about acoustic wave therapy post prostatectomy? So acoustic wave therapy is very interesting. I was involved in some of the trials in San Francisco when they first started to, to test this out. Uh, and for those who haven't heard of it, it's essentially energy that's transmitted from the outside into the penis. Um, some do acoustic waves, some do low-dose shock wave. There are different ways to do it. Sometimes you also get what's called platelet-rich plasma or cells, and you inject that first. And what that does is it basically, it's kind of like shaking things up and trying to get those cells to regenerate themselves, for lack of a better way to put it. Um, unfortunately, it has not found very consistent results, um, even for normal organic erectile dysfunction, which can occur due to age or diabetes or whatever it may be. Uh, and so it's also very unclear whether it's going to be helpful after prostatectomies. Unfortunately, most of the large trials we've done have not found it to be very effective after a prostatectomy, which is what your main question was. In the future, maybe, but it's not really, it's not really there yet. So I would save your money because it's usually not covered by insurance. Uh, so in your case, you know, that few thousand dollars for an experimental therapy that we haven't seen work too much, I'd probably avoid. Good to know. Uh, next question is about PSA numbers. Can you take supplements to improve your PSA numbers? Um, typically, um, PSA numbers aren't necessarily going to change all that much with supplementation uh, unless you're taking a medication uh, or medication class like finasteride. Um, uh, finasteride is a medication that actually shrinks the prostate. It does so over about a 9 to 12 month period of time. And it should also cut your PSA in half. Now, that's a artificial decrease um, uh, when someone comes to me and they've been on finasteride and doing prostate cancer screening. Uh, whatever their PSA is, I double it to get the actual number. Um, in the same vein, I, I wouldn't necessarily try to decrease your PSA. It's not really of any importance to decrease your PSA. Um, a PSA is actually a helpful value that we can use uh, to to detect uh, early cancer. Um, the PSA in itself is not the issue. Uh, it's just that cancer tends to produce more PSA than an enlarged prostate or than a you know, normal sized prostate. Um, so we're able to use that as a marker um, for prostate cancer screening. Yeah, and if the main concern is to reduce your risk for prostate cancer, like Dr. Schuyler says, it's not just reducing your PSA, it's reducing that risk. And so, some of those strategies, Dr. Schuyler, are probably what, like low, very, very low fat diet, not smoking, some of the other, um, what are some of the other ones you guys? I mean, typically, uh, those are the main ones. Uh, the, the um, just a heart healthy diet in general, because um, uh, uh, things that have been linked are you know, family history, which obviously we can't change, um, uh, but smoking and, and obesity on top of that are the things I try to minimize the most. All right, I got uh, two questions here uh, that are kind of around the same topic of uh, Kegel exercises. So we'll start with the first one here. Are you saying that Kegel exercises no longer help after six months to a year post prostatectomy? Yes. Actually, I mean, it's probably a little bit of a controversial statement because most urologists will keep telling you, just keep doing those exercises, keep doing those exercises. But the truth is, if you look at some of the long term studies, Kegel's exercises done correctly is the main thing. Um, if they're done properly and correctly with or without in conjunction with a physical therapist, the likelihood that they're going to provide any discernible or clinically significant, meaning some realistic improvement after one year is very low. Now, that being said, most people don't really know the right way to do a Kegel's exercise. 
And because it takes so much pro uh, practice and you know ability to learn, um, sometimes you will, and it's appropriate for a urologist to tell you to keep doing it because they probably assume that first three, six months you weren't doing it correctly anyway. Um, but once you're doing it properly for six months to a year, it's unlikely they're going to help a lot for that. Now, with that said, it's also not going to harm you at all to do them longer. Um, Absolutely. One of the things I always tell my patients after surgery um, to kind of hit home how to do a Kegel exercise uh, appropriately is I tell them to pee and midstream stop their stream, count to three, and then finish peeing. Um, then you know you're trying to strengthen that that the appropriate muscle. Um, and once you've done that, you realize what that muscle is that you need to tighten in order to uh, uh, strengthen the sphincter. You can then do that in a, in a situation where you're sitting or watching TV. Um, if you just try to do it while sitting or watching TV, you're unlikely to be using the uh, correct muscle. Great tip. All right, and then the follow-up for that, I have returning incontinence after prostatectomy from 20 years ago. The Kegel exercises no longer work. Will a sling be a good choice for someone in my shoes? Maybe, maybe not. So, you know, there are two types of urinary incontinence. One is that right after surgery, that drip, 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 like leaky faucet because that valve is not working well. And the second is irritation of the bladder for uh, various reasons. That could be due to, you know, other things that are affecting your bladder, things you drink, diabetes, um, other sorts of disease processes. It also could represent something different has happened on the inside. For example, scar tissue or things like that have developed on the inside of the urethra over time. So a lot can happen in 20 years. Uh, so what you really need is a good uh, proper exam. You need an ultrasound to look at your bladder to make sure it's emptying. You may or may not need a small camera to take a look inside to make sure there hasn't been some aberrant healing or something like that. Uh, and you need a proper history to see when that leakage is occurring. If it's happening, you know, when you're laying still and not moving a lot, you might want to try medications first, provide the other studies were okay. But if it really is that valve has gotten weak again, then yes, a sling might work. But after 20, a lot can happen in those 20 years, so you don't want to just jump to conclusions. All right, next question here. I just found out that I have prostate cancer. What is the next step for me? What should I be asking or doing to prepare? So um, after having been diagnosed with prostate cancer, typically uh, a discussion should be had regarding your Gleason score, um, uh, whether you have that low risk, intermediate risk, or high risk. I think that's important to know. Uh, uh, there's a lot of other information that um, is valuable, such as PSA level. Um, and then it kind of comes down to treatment options. Like we had discussed, you have, you have treatment options of active surveillance, surgery, and radiation. Um, as to who is appropriate for what option, uh, some of it's just personal preference. Um, like we were saying in the presentation, low risk prostate cancer can obviously, or can often be watched. Um, but if you have a lot of low risk prostate cancer, intermediate or high risk cancer, often should go on to some sort of treatment. Um, some of that is based on age, some of it's based on your other health conditions. Um, there's a lot of nuance to, to who should undergo what treatment. Um, but uh, the important things to know are your PSA level, um, your Gleason score, which, like I had mentioned, ranges from six to ten, um, and usually that will guide treatment. And then, and then to what you're a candidate for. Um, and if you're a candidate for everything, then that's great. You you have options in your favor to uh, kind of undergo what you would prefer um, to undergo. When when talking about surgery, some of the important things are are how many surgeries that your urologist has done. Um, obviously, the, someone who's doing more surgeries uh, is going to tend to have better results overall um, and be more comfortable doing it, lower risks. Um, radiation, urologists don't typically do radiation. We usually uh, transfer that care to a radiation oncologist to take care of. Um, we often are still involved uh, if it's something like SEEDS, uh, which is also known as brachytherapy. Uh, often, it's, it's the urologist and the radiation oncologist together who put those in. Um, anyway, but it, often it's just gathering some more information. Um, uh, and first and foremost, it's your Gleason score, your PSA level, and your uh, which determines your risk uh, stratification.
All right. Uh, and then next question here, kind of come along the lines from someone who just had their prostate removed. Um, they just had their prostate removed 15 weeks ago and recovering is going well. Should they start using a VED for penis rehab now or should they wait longer? Under most circumstances, it probably would be okay uh, to get started with either a vacuum erection device or with a uh, oral medicine like a, like a low-dose Viagra or a low-dose Cialis that's taken two to three times a week. Uh, both of those would be reasonable ways to get started. Uh, of course, double check with your urologist to make sure there wasn't something unusual during the surgery where they want you to wait, but most people, yes, it's a good time to get started. Yeah, I would add that typically uh, my post-surgery regimen is I see uh, at about seven to ten days after or seven to fourteen days after surgery, I remove the catheter. We go over pathology results, and then I see it four weeks later with a first PSA, and also at that uh, four weeks that second appointment, which is six weeks after surgery, four weeks after catheter removal. That's when I start erectile rehab. So um, uh, being fifteen weeks out, I I often uh, would have started erectile rehab. And once again, as Dr. Bob had, had alluded to, that's assuming that you are a good candidate for it and there's no other um, reasons you shouldn't be taking it. All right, next question here is around PSAs. Uh, how effective or valid is a PSA test? I heard that certain physical activities can affect the accuracy of the results. So that is true. So, the PSA has gotten kind of a bad rap over um, the more recent years, uh, even to the point of where some family practitioners and internists uh, no longer do prostate cancer screening. With that said, since the advent of PSA of the PSA in the early 90s, we've significantly decreased death from prostate cancer and and metastatic disease at diagnosis. So while it's it's you know it doesn't give you all the answers, it's it's better than not having anything. Um, um, so I, I would still highly recommend uh, uh, prostate cancer screening, um, uh, including a PSA and a and a digital rectal exam. I, w I will agree that some of those activities can increase it, though. I had a you know you always remember stories. I had a patient who was a, a bike rider, and he'd ride a hundred hundred miles at a time, and he got his PSA checked the day later, and boy, it was sky high. So anything that could put pressure on that perineum. Um, you know, riding a bike aggressively, heavy activity, you know, people, um, some, you know, we've got, everyone's got different lifestyles, so anal sex, things like that. Even regular sexual intercourse um, can increase that PSA. So, you know, I usually tell people if you, it was high after one of those, give it a break uh, for two weeks and recheck it and, uh, before you jump to any conclusions. All right, next question here. Uh, I had a prostatectomy three years ago and then I had an artificial urinary sphincter inserted nine months ago. Can I regain sexual function? Absolutely. Uh, so, you know, the uh, artificial urinary sphincter is done for incontinence, and that's not unusual for men who unfortunately have two problems, both the leakage and the erectile issues. Um, most people try to deal with the incontinence first, and it looks like you've had that taken care of uh, with the artificial urinary sphincter. Uh, and then you treat the erectile dysfunction no differently. You try the medications, the injections, and you can still put an implant in if necessary. So everything remains on the table for you, uh, you know, despite having that sphincter already installed. All right, I got an interesting one here. I have the BREA breast cancer gene. How much more likely am I to get breast cancer or prostate cancer because of this? Herman? Well, uh, you know, I, the, there are some genetics that get you at a higher risk for prostate cancer. Uh, the BRCA gene certainly is one of those. Um, however, you know, the risk that's increased by having that BRCA gene actually pales in comparison to the more traditional risk for prostate cancer. So number one remains age. Dr. Schuyler made that comment where if you live long enough, you're gonna get prostate cancer. That's because the number one risk factor for prostate cancer is actually age. Um, uh, other than that, family history is a very strong risk. African-American race is a very high risk for prostate cancer. That only, increase, that only increases your risk for getting prostate cancer, but also 
increases your risk for dying from the disease because it can be more aggressive as a result. So yes, you know, sometimes these things get a lot of press. The BRCA gene, you know, has been all over the news lately because we suddenly found something uh, that can cause that increased risk. Uh, but, uh, you know, if you stay true to the fundamentals, which are the traditional risks, get screened to age 50 to 55 plus, maybe you want to scale it down to age 50 rather than 55. Uh, but other than that, just because you have that gene, um, I think the main take home is get screened, maybe pull it back to 50 instead of 55 uh, and, you know, watch out. Now, that being said, I don't know the risk for increased breast cancer, though, for men with a BRCA gene. Uh, as a urologist, I don't deal with that quite as much. But speaking of the prostate cancer risk, that's a bad advice. Yeah, I think uh, that's uh, an interesting point that uh, Dr. Baga uh, brought up as well which we didn't really touch on earlier was um, the typical screening age is 55 to 70. Uh, for those people, it is in uh, Caucasian males without a family history. Um, we do have to take into consideration uh, family history and also uh, those populations that are more commonly diagnosed with prostate cancer like African-Americans. Um, so we tend to screen at earlier ages for either one of those populations. Um, the uh, American Urological Association is not necessarily clear on when to start. They just recommend to start earlier than age 55. So um, I'll often uh, uh, screen based on when their first degree relative first had prostate cancer for African Americans. I'll often start at 45 or 50. Um, and then for family history, start similarly at 45 or 50. Now the BRCA gene, um, while it can increase your risk of prostate cancer, uh, like Dr. Baga said, it's more, uh, other risk factors are more likely um, to drive uh, the occurrence of prostate cancer. So in someone who was asking that question, I would probably start screening a little bit earlier, um, uh, especially if it was also revealed that a family history of, of uh, prostate cancer. Um, uh, but I also think it's more important to take into consideration just, just age alone and family history rather than the BRCA gene. All right, we're uh, getting close to the end of the event here. So we're gonna ask a few more questions. Um, so we'll start off with uh, one of our last ones here. Have you seen any evidence of marijuana decreasing the urgency of nighttime urination? So I have not seen um, evidence of that in terms of in a paper. However, I have had some anecdotal evidence. Anecdotal means the patients that tell you that. Um, and that would be more uh, for people who have the other type of um, urinary issue after radiation where the bladder is a little bit more irritated, more hyperactive, things like that. Uh, and so maybe it has some sort of calming effect on the bladder. Uh, but to date, I haven't seen any uh, published papers about it uh, as a targeted therapy. All right, uh, let's see, next question here. If you have permanent incontinence and impotence, can you get both the penile implant and the artificial urinary sphincter? Absolutely, absolutely. I've certainly done that for patients. You can do one at a time. You can even do both at the same time, uh, but there's no reason why both of those can't be treated so you can have your uh, proper quality of life. All right, and kind of a follow-up question for that. How complicated and how discreet is an implant? So, you know, it goes along with what Dr. Schuyler said earlier about any type of surgery. It's about that surgeon's experience level. Um, you know, it's uh, for those who have a high volume, who do the surgery very frequently, it's a relatively quick operation. You know, uh, I do quite a few of these, so it rarely takes me more than about an hour, hour and a half or so to get this done properly. Um, so, you know, that goes to the ease of the surgery itself. The recovery period is at least, you know, want to take at least a week or two off. Just to, most people are up and walking around. At this point, I send people home the same day at this point. Um, so you can see that tells you that you're back to your functional state. But things can be a little bit sore, you know, a little bit bruised up, that sort of thing. Uh, and so you do want to allow yourself that week or two to heal up after surgery. Uh, how discreet is it? It is very discreet. Everything's on the inside. You can't see it from the outside. Um, so really, no one knows that you have it unless they actually feel your genitals. And then, of course, you have to be able to feel the device because that's how it works. 
All right, and the last question here, what is the best uh, for VEDs, what is the best pump therapy regimen for length maintenance after prostate surgery? So, you know, there are different ways to do it. Um, although the vacuum erection device is a decent um, rehabilitation therapy, I actually prefer the medications. Why? Because the vacuum erection device, although it is pulling blood into the penis, that's venous blood, which is less oxygenated than arterial blood. Uh, so if a man can tolerate it and it's safe for them, I actually recommend a low-dose Viagra or Cialis as a primary treatment for a penile rehabilitation afterwards. Now, that being said, if they're not a good candidate, then the vacuum erection device is a fine kind of way to do it. A minimum of three times a week is when it should be done. Um, but, uh, you know, if at all possible, you want to take the tablets. All right. So with that, we'll go ahead and wrap up the event. I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Schuyler and Dr. Baga for taking the time to present today. And we'd also like to thank everyone listening in for attending this MinMD Real Talk webinar. We hope it was informative and you'll join us again in the future. If you'd like to learn more, you have a few options. Uh, there are more resources in the Resource Center on MinMD.com. Visit this page to view instructional videos, guides, expert articles, and much, much more. You can also call MinMD at 857-233-5837 or log into the Password Protected Secure MinMD portal to schedule an appointment with a cl MinMD clinical case manager. If you don't have a specialist, uh, for your sexual urinary tract health or prostate health, MinMD has a new physician finder service. Go to MinMD.com and click find a physician to get started there. And finally, you can learn more about uh, implants and other devices as well as insurance coverage by visiting edcure.org. We'll also be sending a follow-up email with references and helpful resources and links to each after the event. I'd like to thank everyone again for attending today's webinar, and we will see you at the next one. Thank you much. Thank you.